Justin Tomlinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise in this debate, though it is a somewhat of a deja vu feeling for me, because I feel it was only yesterday that I was talking about the very same subject. No wonder Groundhog Day was one of my favourite films. And I wish to pay tribute to the Honourable Member for Airdrie and Shots for his proactive work in this area. As a former minister, I enjoyed engaging and meeting with him on a number of occasions, and he always had uh, real experience, real practical suggestions to challenge and to hold to account the government in this very important area. And it's good to see so many numbers across uh, all of the benches engaging in this debate. And it is important because we do have excellent ministers in this department who genuinely do listen, they do engage and they do act and they do influence the direction. So it's a credit to all of the members who come forward. I just want to very briefly touch on the background of the position where we stand today. Yesterday I talked a lot about universal credit and less so about ESA RAG. I'll flip it round this time. But we have, as a government, introduced the national living wage, which has helped 2.75 million of our lowest earners, and we hope to see that rise over £9 by 2020. The increase in the personal tax allowance from 6495 uh, pounds to 11,000 has taken the lowest 3.2 million earners out of paying any income tax at all. We, ask, we have the strongest economic growth of any developed economy, which is delivering record employment, and yesterday's figures saw another 461,000 people enter into work. And disabled employment, we have seen uh, 590,000 more disabled people in work in the last three years, with a closing, an increase of about 4% on, on where we are. Still much further to go. I thought. <laughs> I wonder if I can just remind him, and I mentioned this in the exchange yesterday, of the press release issued in his name by the DWP on the 29th of June last year, which said this, and I quote, the government aims to halve the gap between the disabled employment rate and the overall employment rate by 2020. Is he dismayed as I am that that commitment, the promise that he made, I'm sure in good faith, the 2020 deadline for that promise has been abandoned by his successor? I predicted that intervention was coming, uh, and it's an important one. It was an incredibly popular pledge with stakeholders. It focused officials' minds. A lot of my work as a former minister was lobbying other government departments. It was very helpful when I was able to name-check the then Prime Minister as it was his personal pledge. Actually, I, I don't recall that press release, because my understanding was we hadn't actually set the date, because the date was going to be determined in the Green Paper. For my personal view, I wanted to see significant progress year on year. One of the problems with just taking it like that would have been, it could have been that the, uh, the number of disabled people in work could have been static, but in a recession, the overall numbers in work would fall and the gap would have closed, yet no disabled people had benefited. And I wanted to see a number, an actual sort of figure, whether that was we'll have a million more people in by a certain date, and then we could know a million more disabled people have benefited. But we were due to consult on that as part of the Green Paper when I was there. Yes. Um, and I agree with them that a single target can be a crude measure. Would it have been sensible perhaps to have had two targets, therefore? A target to reduce the disability employment gap by half by 2020, as the Department appeared to be committed to doing last year, and a numerical target. And does he think that's a suggestion that the new ministerial team might consider? I think that's twice as good as the current plans. It's a brilliant suggestion, and there we go. And, and I think all of those targets do focus minds and genuinely it did make a difference in pushing and that was a lot of what we had to do we, we didn't necessarily have all of the levers ourselves and to have that to focus minds makes a significant difference wages have increased 2.3 percent this year against inflation at 0.9 percent which fell this week again helping people and we've extended childcare. Now, briefly on to the, the points about universal credit. This will make a significant difference. Yeah. I do thank him. But he, he, he mentions the rise in, 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 in incomes and wages uh, with the implication that people, more people in work will benefit. Um, but with the collapse in the value of sterling, the Bank of England is predicting that a 10% fall in real incomes over the next three years. We are, we are awash with predictions from experts and have been ever since the, the middle of the referendum campaign and 
so-called experts were predicting that inflation would have spiked this week and we saw a fall. We will see what happens. Good governments keep a very close eye on these things and act accordingly. Now, on to the universal credit. We are still some way off the full rollout, but the aspiration and the difference this will make for people is significant because through universal credit you will have a named work coach. So uh, the Honourable Member for Gateshead and the Honourable Member for Glasgow North East both highlighted cases. We all have difficult cases where the system has failed. One of the key advantages with the full rollout of universal credit is every single claimant will have a personal named coach who will stay with them, whose job is to not only help them get into work, but to navigate all of the challenges they, they face, dealing with very complex benefits, making sure if the system isn't uh, supporting them in the way that it should be, that they will help them address that, not just relying on coming to members of parliaments or councillors or the Citizens Advice Bureau, and that will make a significant difference. Yes. The point that's been made by an honourable member, but, but in, in, in the case of my constituent, he was unable to get any backdating and was actually left absolutely destitute. I mean, outrageous behaviour by the department, and I'm afraid to say all I can see is a cost-cutting exercise. Well, I, I don't recognise it as a cost-cutting exercise. Without knowing all the details, it's very difficult. I hope the ministerial team will go and have a look in that. We'll meet with you and look and, and see if there are lessons to be learnt from that. They will also sign posts where there is training available to, again, enhance people's uh, hopes of either getting into work or progressing in work. Obviously, the traditional job searching. And for the first time ever, provide support for people as they go into work. Because a lot of people, as they come off benefits, will go into relatively or very low-paid work and they will not necessarily have the confidence or the skills to push themselves on forward to go and get those higher roles with, uh, with higher wages. And so for the first time they will keep in touch with those people to make sure that uh, they are, you know, you've turned up for work for three months, uh, why don't you now try and go for a supervisor role, increase your hours, etc, etc. And crucially, for those people with fluctuating health conditions, the benefit is in real time. So if people can work less hours one week than another, there is a minimum income and then it goes on and the more hours your income increases and it removes that 16 hour cliff edge that we're preventing people from benefiting. Now today's debate is predominantly looking at ESA RAG and, and before I comment as I did yesterday I do want to take a moment to pay tribute to the fantastic work of the staff in the job centres, the support groups such as PLUS, Shaw, there are many local charities, national charities are providing support. They do a huge amount of brilliant work and often go unrecognised. The reality is ESA has had so many reviews, so many changes, um, yet there are still only 1% of people coming off the benefit every month. There is no way of describing that as anything other than fairly the people on there. A number of speakers highlighted the fact that you can be uh, on two years uh, on ESA typically, yet on JSA you would expect to get into work much sooner. Yet bizarrely, uh, before changes are coming forward, if you were on JSA, closer to the jobs market, you would get 710 minutes of professional support. Yet on ESA, where you're recognised to be further away from the jobs market, you would only get 105 minutes. So some of these changes that are being brought in will actually equalise that to make sure those people get there. And, and it's crucial going forward that we identify what people can do, not what they can't do. We're all different. We all have challenges in our lives. Some have more challenges than others. But most people have an opportunity with the right support. And the green paper being brought forward is very, very welcome, because it highlights that significance of that there is a can-do that we have to offer personalised and tailored support to give everybody that opportunity. And crucially, the major charities, including Scope, Leonard Cheshire, RNIB, National Statistics Society, MENCAP, and all of the charities, right down to the smaller ones, are going to be contributing to the development of this policy, the delivery, and they will make a, a big difference. Yes. Um, would my honourable friend agree that whilst his charities, and I agree, are very welcoming of this new green paper, um, they are also still consistent in one voice saying that the cuts to ESA RAG are still wrong and it's not replaced in the green paper? Well, I, I remember as a minister being challenged on a whole host of issues and, that, and that's what they are there to do. I personally feel the extra support being put in place is, is worth us doing this because only 1% of people are coming off that benefit and when you survey people on ESA, when we talk to them in our constituencies, they are overwhelmingly desperate to be given an opportunity to work. Already we are seeing more, I'm, I'm, I'm now running out of time so I, 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 will, I will try and wrap up my stuff, I've only got two minutes to go. We are seeing more personalised and tailored 
uh, support. There are quicker assessments. This is particularly important because 50% of people on the ESA have a mental health condition, yet they are waiting typically nine months for an assessment. This green paper will address that because it will make sure that people ha are assessed quickly and then given that support before they navigate often very difficult personal challenges to take that step back into work. There will be a place on the work and health programme or work choice for those who wish to take it. It's a voluntary opportunity. There will be additional places on the very popular uh, specialist employment support programme. There will be job clubs run by peers. So those who have disabilities themselves, those who have gone through that system, those who have overcome that fear. And it's often a big fear for people who have been out of work for a long time, the thought of going back into that process. There will be 200 new community parties, uh, partners, again utilising disability expertise, and there will be increased access to work for young people with mental health conditions. And there are further opportunities through the Disability Confident campaign. And my personal favourite, the one that I continue to champion, uh, is the small employer offer. Because time and time again, employers are saying to us, we have skills gaps and we are struggling to find people to fill those roles. But they have never thought to take on somebody with a disability because they lack the confidence. They don't realise the huge amount of support that is provided to help people to come into the work. And those businesses that take that step more often than not benefit. And I say that as a former employer who did employ disabled people, who did benefit from doing that. And this small employer offer pilot that's currently working, I hope will be, con will be continuously expanded, will become a nationwide offer. And and it is making a significant difference. And the Chancellor was right to increase significantly the funding for access to work. And on the Fit for Work scheme, we need to look to make sure that we're providing advice at the beginning of a potential problem for people in work, not just at four weeks, because it is so much easier to keep people in work with the suitable support than it is to get them back into work after they've dropped out. We have a fantastic ministerial team. They are engaging with the charities with all of their experience and knowledge. This Green Paper is a real opportunity. Thank you.